listening to a Roddenberry podcast. Don't touch that dial. We'll be right back. We'll have more news this evening, but first, the latest genealogy, a Roddenberry podcast. Episode 20, Jet Flight. Welcome to Mission Log Genealogy. I'm Earl Green. And I'm Norman Lau. Each week on Genealogy, we explore the back catalog of Gene Roddenberry's early TV writing, examining it for the kind of morals, messages, and meanings that he planted in his later work. This week, we're leaving on a jet flight, hoping that we will not die of fright. Well, that's really up to our hero, who will have to see if there actually is something more to fear... And no, not the one that looks like a clown. I will be back with trivia in a moment right after Norm tells all of you how you can reach us. Genealogy is meant to be entertaining and informative, but it's also the beginning of an ongoing conversation about the works of Gene Roddenberry. Drop us a line at missionlog at roddenberry.com and join us on X, formerly known as Twitter, and Facebook at missionlogpod. While you're at it, leave us a review and a rating at Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast platform. And please remember your comments can be used on future installments of Genealogy. And now, here's Earl Green with this week's trivia. Thank you, Norman. I hope I can stick the landing. This episode of West Point aired on February 8th, 1957, as best we're able to tell. And there are some really interesting guest stars this time around. Richard Erdman stars as Captain Don Prickett. Enid Oklahoma's own Richard Erdman, and Richard is definitely a that-guy actor. You have seen him in something, such as the 53 episodes of Community, in which he appeared as Leonard. His movie appearances stretch from the 40s through TV appearances in 2017. He worked almost to the end of his life in 2019. When I say movies, I mean movies. Stalag 17, Anything Goes... Tora, Tora, Tora. Richard also did a huge amount of voice work in projects such as The Thirteen Ghosts of Scooby-Doo, The New Johnny Quest, Smurfs, DuckTales, Snorks, The Page Master, and Batman the Animated Series. As Cadet Chuck Callstat, we have Bill Lundmark. His IMDb credits span less than a decade. He appears in a later West Point episode in a different role, and he made lots of appearances in TV playhouse shows as well as Wagon Train, Men Into Space, and Peter Gunn. Now, appearing as Chuck's buddy Kenny Hedges, another cadet, we have Ron Foster, whose credits include Twilight Zone, The Outer Limits, 12 O'Clock High, and Bonanza. Ron also appeared as a police dispatcher in many episodes of Highway Patrol, although none of them were written by Gene. We do have a future Trek connection in the cast this week, Morgan Jones, as the engineer's officer, played Colonel Nesvig in Assignment Earth. Okay, it's a really minor connection, but that's the sort of thing that people would bring to my attention if I didn't bring it to theirs. Just for the record, Jet Flight is one of the highest rated episodes of West Point, according to IMDb, but it is not the highest rated, a distinction which goes to Man of Action. So, how was it? Kenny, do you remember Camp Buckner? Slide for life on that wire stretched across the lake? Learning how to handle live grenades? Calling for machine gun fire at Fort Benny? Yeah? Am I bragging if I say it didn't bother me much? No, I guess not. I think you even enjoyed it. It's funny. Guy breezes through anything and then... I don't know. What are you getting at, anyway? I'm through, Kenny. Hey, who are you kidding? No joke, Kenny. I'm not going on that flight tomorrow. Well, that's crazy. You got to. It's required. The army requires something else, too. Courage, bravery, guts. Whatever it is, I haven't got it. I was so tied up, I couldn't even move. Look at me. I'm still shaking. Maybe it's a lucky thing I found it out before someone depending on me got hurt. Act 1. Cadet Thompson welcomes us to an Air Force base. 
He's not at West Point this week, but he is letting us know that Army cadets do get time in the jump seats of Air Force fighter jets, learning the plane's capabilities and learning some flight basics. This week's tale focuses on Army cadet Chuck Kallstadt, who has had a little bit of flight experience in the past, but nothing that's going to pull the kind of G's that he's about to do riding shotgun in a T-33. After the pre-flight checks, it's just seconds before Kallstadt is roaring through the air, listening to Captain Prickett's wisdom from the pilot's seat. And, um, hang on a minute. A light goes off in front of the pilot. Aft section, heat warning. The engine's running too hot. Captain Prickett tells Chuck to be ready to eject if necessary, but not to touch the eject handle until he gives the order. And with that... He shuts the engine off as a precaution, and suddenly, they're flying a very fast glider. But they should be able to make it down safely, even with a dead stick landing. Captain Prickett goes into a dive, and then levels off to lose some speed for the landing. On the ground, the airbase's emergency vehicles roar to life. In the plane, Chuck is practically holding his breath as Captain Prickett lowers the gear and brings the plane down for a landing like nothing was wrong. The emergency vehicles flanking the plane on the runway remind Chuck that was a bit of a close one. As the two men ride back to the base, Chuck Kallstad admits that he was afraid. The captain says that's okay. Infantry exercises on the ground would probably scare him. They'll try again tomorrow. But Chuck's not so sure. Nothing the army has ever thrown at him has phased him. Until this. He's afraid that this will be the point where he washes out as a cadet. Chuck's afraid this means he hasn't got the guts to serve in the military, and he says it's a good thing to find this out now before it means someone else gets hurt. The cadets are on the ground for the rest of the day learning about the importance of the oxygen gear fighter pilots wear and getting to know the plane's engine systems. The instructor notes that Cadet Callstat's harrowing experience was actually an equipment problem Not a real in-flight emergency, but it was best to land as soon as possible, just to make sure. The next day, it is mere minutes before Chuck is due at the flight line, and he's not there. A fellow cadet, to whom he confided his fears in, urges him to get out there and get back on the horse. Or, back in the plane. Chuck is more sure than ever that his army career is about to be cut short after one last flight. Act 2 Certain that is going to be the event that puts an end to his army career, Cadet Kallstadt is back in the air with Captain Prickett. What's the only thing that could heighten Chuck's anxiety even more than the plane's 30,000-foot altitude? Here, Cadet, you take the controls. Your aircraft. Two warning lights go off, one that Chuck can see and one that he can't. The one that he can see tells him that the gear has lowered and it's unsafe to do so at this altitude. The warning light he can't see... There's a problem with the pilot's oxygen flow. Captain Prickett sees the landing gear light too and brings the gear back up. As he turns to see why Chuck seems so distracted, Prickett doesn't notice when his oxygen mask's hose disconnects from the feed from the oxygen supply. Uh, hey, remember that whole kind of dry lecture about how without the oxygen mask, hypoxia is going to kick in and leave the pilot unconscious? Captain Prickett passes out in mid-sentence and the plane enters a dive. Chuck's so still freaked out in the jump seat that he doesn't notice until another training aircraft calls on the radio to ask if Prickett's plane is under control. (laughs) By the way, is there anyone on board who knows how to fly a plane? That's a negative, Ghost Rider. Yes, Cadet calls that they're asking about your plane, and you're at 9,000 feet and falling. Chuck grabs the stick and levels the plane off out of the dive. The other pilot and the tower talk him through some basics. But Chuck is ordered by the tower to be ready to bail out with or without his pilot, if the pilot in the chase plane tells him to. Chuck doesn't want to leave Prickett to die in the crash that would happen after he does that, but it is in order. At 3,000 feet, the air pressure environment allows Prickett to regain consciousness and reattach his air hose. They're low on fuel and will have to attempt a landing on a dry lake bed nearby. Oh, and one other thing. Prickett's very grateful that his passenger didn't bail out and leave him behind. He tells Chuck that he can bail out now if he wants, but the cadet stays put. You scared back there? Chuck says, yes, sir, and is surprised when Captain Prickett says, me too, Tiger, me too. 
wheels down, and it's a survivable landing after coming in low over terrain that was anything but favorable for a landing. Both the veteran pilot and the cadet are lucky to be in one piece. Afterward, it's time for the cadets to fly back to West Point. Captain Prickett catches up with his star student one last time before takeoff and thanks him again for not punching out when the regs say he really should have. The end. Excellent job as always, Norman. You brought it in for a safe landing. Thank you so much. That reminds me of a scene from Airplane Part... I think it's Part 2. It's like, we're going to get them down and down safe. And then the safe like falls out of the sky. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, at the beginning, I really enjoyed... Uh, Cadet Charles Thompson's kind of his voiceover. He says that uh, something along the lines uh, about uh, Kallstadt's attitude as, you know, being fearful, but there's nothing to fear but fear itself. And that phrase, a lot of you probably know this from your United States history. This is a phrase that was first coined by President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And I want to give, again, like a little short snippet of a history lesson as we do here, you know, on genealogy. When Franklin, and this is from uh, I think it was from an online article that I read from like a historic, a very historical archives website could have been actually archives.gov. When Franklin Delano Roosevelt was elected to the presidency in 1932, it was on a promise to restore the confidence of the American people and try to bring America out of the great depression. Roosevelt stated that in his first inaugural address that quote, we have nothing to fear but fear itself, end quote. His objectives were to calm the economic fears of Americans, develop policies to alleviate the problems of the Great Depression, and gain the support of the American people for his programs. But in this case, when Charles Thompson uses it as a mean to describe Chuck Kallstadt's predicament, it really sets a different individual tone for anyone who can relate to what that means. There's nothing to fear but fear itself. Yeah, the thought also occurs that's a much more recent phrase at the time that this show was produced. Yeah, some 20 years, right? Yeah. 20-ish years. Yeah, 25. 20 plus years. And so, you know, at that point, it is probably in the common parlance, you know, it's almost on the 1950s meme level, if you will. It probably had a lot of power to deploy that phrase in this script. Now, one thing about Cadet Lieutenant Thompson this week, I noticed we were getting a bit more narration from him than usual. But I strongly suspect that that was something that happened in post-production to sort of ease the joins because we have, I think we have quite a bit of original footage of the aircraft, but we also undoubtedly do have some Air Force stock footage, fighter jets like the F-100. I really find myself questioning what the balance of previously shot footage to new footage was for this episode because it does not look like they cheaped out at all. You know, I have um, a couple of questions myself that I wanted to ask you uh, during the course of like here in observations and then later on discussions about production. And I'll get to that. I'll get to one of them in a second. There's a great line again with, with what Chuck is bringing now, uh, the actor who plays Chuck, I should say, he says, in an emergency, you've got to think and move as fast as your airplane. And this triggered this memory for me, from 1985's Top Gun, right, when Tom Cruise's Maverick says to Kelly McGillis's Charlie, you don't have time to think up there. If you think, you're dead. And she snaps back, well, that's a big gamble with a $30 million plane lieutenant. I was kind of hoping that we were going to see something like that along those lines in this episode because it's just one of those, are we dealing with, like, fear to incite this kind of cockiness in a pilot or are we dealing with something else? And when we get to other discussion points, we know that we're dealing with something else. Did you, does, does any of these kind of, um, these tropes, uh, that pop up in these episodes, which may not have been tropes at the time, do they trigger anything in you? Like, Oh yeah, I've kind of seen this before. I've heard this before, but at the same time, when these episodes came out, they weren't seen or heard from before. Right. <laughs> well, that's exactly it. And that's kind of the, the perspective that we have to always kind of, wrestle into the frame on genealogy is that while you and I, Norm, have grown up in the era of Top Gun, Iron Eagle, so many other things, you know, at this point we've had a Top Gun sequel. Mm -hmm. And so they may seem tropish to us. When I looked into the makes and models of aircraft that were shown in this episode, 
Some of them had only been in service for less than a decade. So these things are not... They may seem like tropes to us now, with decades of further storytelling that build on what this episode does and amps it up considerably, especially with the benefit of special effects. In 1957... That was not the case. This stuff was still brand new. Really, just the thought of having fighter jockeys. You know, these ace pilots flying things that move so fast, you almost don't have the room to do anything but go on instinct. Mm -hmm. That was still a new concept at the time. And I really... I kind of wonder what the production path, or actually the pre-production pathway of this episode was, I wonder if it was suggested to Gene, hey, let's, we can get some Air Force hardware, let's show off some Air Force hardware. Or if Gene wrote a script and said, hey, guys, we're going to need some Air Force hardware. Since we have people from the Pentagon looking over everything, you know, I'm just going to put this in the script, like, you know, this is directed at you. Can you get us some planes? Can you get us on an air base? That's something that um, I want to get into like a little bit later on because I had the exact same thing. And one of the um, responses that I had to your production question earlier for our audience, you know, that is unable to watch this episode, you know, unless you have a way to watch it or if you have the DVD set. I wanted to point out a few scenes that help set the tone for this opening act, but at the same time, though, almost um, point out these issues with production, not issues per se, but kind of like the highlights of what we're talking about here about the production. So. There's an opening scene where you see the scrambling of combat-ready cadets pouring into covered trucks and being transported to an undisclosed Air Force base, obviously for TV, which is fully occupied and stocked with jet fighters all over the tarmac. And this is uh, one of the questions I have for you, Earl. Like, the sounds of the jets on the tarmac are real, right? And they're very loud. And in my estimation, the kind of like sound production issue that you would have to work with because of the authenticity of it. But do you think that this posed a challenge for any way to the production itself? I mean, was there ADR as we know it and dialogue looping or would Ziv even entertain the production cost to do that, to fix that anyway? Oh, I'm sure they had to, in this case, at this point in the history of film, when things were on film, You usually have a sound recording, the person with the boom mic on set. That mic is going to a separate recording device. It's not going to the camera. And so you would have a sound recordist along with the film crew capturing that. And in this case, you know, I'm sure they did gather natural sound, or what in the news business we used to call gnats, on site, but it may have been that they didn't even bother to have the actors do their dialogue until later because you're not going to be able to fight jet engines. You're not going to be able to fight against that kind of decibels in real time on site. One thing I really like about this episode is that there is some casual but respectful banter between the servicemen in different branches. No hazing, you know, we're, it's not a gargantuan battle of egos, everyone's on the same side. I know there's a lot of movies and a lot of TV that like to point up rivalries between the branches of the service. It was kind of nice to see that not played up for once. I really liked the fighter pilot's admission that ground combat would scare the hell out of him. Oh, yeah. You know, Captain Prickett was saying that in many ways could have been its own episode like this, but in reverse, where an Air Force, like if it was instead of West Point, it was, the, you know, the Air Force Academy and then somebody there had to go ride shotgun with an infantryman and do infantryman things like, you know, attack a gun nest or throw grenades. And I like that there's a flip side to all of these stories, right? Yeah, he's really cozy in the cockpit of that plane. It's, oh, yeah. Speaking of which, did you notice that they could have gotten away with no background in the cockpit. Instead, they had all this rear projection stuff going on with moving scenery that you could see through the cockpit. Did you notice that? Yeah, I thought that was really well done. Actually, I, I, I freeze-framed a lot during the recap, but aside from that, I just love looking at the technology inside the cockpit, you know, because you have probably at that time, you had, you know, close-ups of helmets, 
you know, and uh, safety equipment and the lighting and like even the font packages. Cause if anyone actually listens to my diatribes on either mission log or discord, you know how much I love font packages. It just adds to the realism of everything because you're dealing with something that you probably don't see just in, in uh, like when you go to a bookstore, like they probably don't have a lot of magazines dedicated to this kind of coverage at the time, right? You're actually seeing it as if you were there, like if you were like on a fly in the cockpit, so to speak. Yeah. I liked some of the, some of the tech that we saw in terms of almost how primitive it was, like the little indicator on the pilot controls that, you know, show your oxygen flow. That, that seemed very low tech, but sometimes that's what works. I'm a huge watch fanatic and I love looking at Flieger watches or pilot style watches because they are nothing but a black dial and large white, either numerals or, you know, hash marks or things that just tell you the time. So you can see it instantly, <laughs> right? There's no fuss, no muss. It's like, this is the time and this is what you need to know. And that's it. Well, it, you know, if you have a big hairy furball going on, you know, you've got to be able to look and see it immediately. Right. Recording time of explosion. I can see that. Good. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like, <laughs> nope, you know, happened at 1700. <laughs> yep. It, I am not expecting anyone in this show to be Marlon Brando or any other great actor because, of course, we have talked many times about how Ziv just cranked these puppies out on a 30-hour production cycle. But the guy doing the briefing about the necessity of oxygen masks, that whole scene feels like, I am reading this off of cue cards because it's technical dialogue and I can't remember a word of it. It's just weird pauses and a weird cadence that just took me right out of it. And we talked about this before recording. Is this an actor? Or is this an actual Air Force instructor who just wound up in front of the camera and just kind of went deer in the headlights on them? Well, it's kind of like, um, you know, the director says, tell us a little bit about oxygen deprivation. Because the most positive critique that I can describe, he was antiseptically clinical. That's how I felt about his performance. He was giving us exactly what you needed to know in order to get to the next scene, which obviously, you know, in the recap and in and, and these notes, it's like, remember that scene about oxygen deprivation because it was so painfully obvious that you're supposed to pay attention to this guy? Yeah, it's coming up. And it did. Yeah. Um, Actor-wise, though, I really liked the two actors that played, you know, Prickett and Kostat because they had to act a lot from behind their oxygen masks. There's a lot of eye contact with them fear being conveyed, things of that nature. Um, and also, we never really mentioned Kenny a lot, uh, at least in our discussions so far. And I always thought that the actor who played him looks a lot like the actor that you get if you don't get Robert Vaughn. You get this guy. <laughs> Wish app Robert Or like Vaughn. Robert Vaughn's, you know, like Robert Vaughn's stand-in. <laughs> yeah, but he was actually good because he has this very pivotal scene. In fact, that's the scene chosen to dramatize in our podcast. You know, the scene where Kenny asks Chuck, what does this mean? What are, you, what are you sitting here monologuing about? Oh, well, Kenny, I'm about to wash out of the service. You can't do that. Golly. Now, at the end of Act 1, this is where I'm really glad that we have this episode on a commercially produced DVD to watch. Because that gives me a fairly good amount of certainty that this is what was broadcast back in the day. The music cue that plays us out at the end of Act 1, it's the last few notes of the Star Trek theme. I swear to you it is. Da, 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 da. I mean, you're waiting for it the sure Soprano to show like up. It. It's exactly those notes in those durations. Now, if we had seen this on YouTube, I would have had some doubts about whether or not that was legit because that would have... That seems so much like, you know, okay, somebody got clever and dubbed something in. Thank you very much for that. Just leave the shows untouched. But, you know, people posting things on YouTube to which they don't necessarily have the copyrights do all sorts of things to try to fool the algorithms. So it's good that this show has been on DVD, and I could see that and comment on it, because if it was 
If it was a random YouTube video, I would have been like, yeah, that's cute. Someone messed with it, though. It, it's uncanny because it's it's the lead out of the Alexander Courage theme. I swear it is. I know. I felt the same way. Uh, I'm glad that you brought that up. I know that you've probably like felt similarly about uh, kind of like the, the obviousness of some of these stories, but I'm wondering if this is the... One of the first times, if not the first time, where we actually see the passenger have to become a pilot and being talked down by, say, the tower commanders or an expert pilot. I mean, at least, here's a good thing. At least they didn't have to call in Rex Kramer, right? And at least they're not flying over Macho Grande. <laughs> I mean, you know, small blessings as they are. The neat thing about this, again, is we are so early in the history of television and film that it's possible... I don't know for sure because, you know, I haven't seen everything that's ever been produced, and I don't think anyone has. So this may be something for the serious film historians to take on. I don't know if that is a new thing here that becomes a trope later, or if it's building on something that already existed. And I really wonder where this story falls in the spectrum of... These stories were based on true facts that we get in the, you know, announcer's intro of every West Point episode. It's like, was it really, or did Gene invent this one out of whole cloth? I would really love to see some notes on the origins of the story. Mentioning that this episode is on DVD and you can still find the DVD if you're willing to shell out a little bit for it. Just depends on how generous the, the Amazon sellers are feeling this week who have copies. It appears that there were either film issues that had to be solved by freeze framing. Uh, for example, I noticed this repeatedly, the shot of Chuck's hand on the plane's control stick. Or was this some sort of dramatic editing choice that was made in 1957? It stuck out to me because it just seemed odd to have that freeze frame in the middle of moving film. And moving audio. Yeah. Right? So, yeah, it's it's a strange... I'm like, okay, so maybe John Woo was a student of this particular director because John Woo does the exact same thing in a lot of his films. You know, he does uses a still shot to convey maybe the seriousness and the intent of it. I'm probably sure that it wasn't the case with this episode, right? But it may have been. He you know, nowadays it is it is a st well, and even then, it's a stylistic choice you can stylistic. make. Stylistic, right? I'm just not sure the the way that the Ziv Sausage Factory worked. Frankly, I don't know that a director would necessarily have the time to think of something like that. That being said, this was a great episode to watch. I mean, all the all the hardware. All of the stuff that they did that was just extra, like doing process photography to have moving scenery behind the cockpit, you know, that you see through the glass cockpit, they didn't have to do that. I would not have counted points off of it if the background of the cockpit scenes was just blank. And, you know, oh, we're just... It, how many times in the history of television have there been car scenes where you know that car is not moving? And it's just blue sky out the window. Oh, but, you know, we're we're driving along and having this conversation. No one would have counted points off for the scenery not being visible through the cockpit. But they went that extra mile. And I really appreciated that. I am going to let my inner aerospace geek out here. The two-seater that Prickett and Kallstadt are flying. This is a Lockheed T-33A, which is a jet training aircraft that had been in service for about a decade at this point. You can't hit Mach 1 in it. It's strictly subsonic. It stays below the sound barrier. It's based on the P-80, but it has a longer fuselage to accommodate the trainee pilot's seat and controls and ejection gear. The episode also contains footage, and this is what I think uh, the stock footage was mainly. The North American Aviation F-100 fighter jet in action which definitely could break the sound barrier. Now, the Air Force also had training aircraft for future F-100 pilots, and that model was called the F-100A, but suffice to say, you would not, under any circumstances, put someone as green as Kallstadt 
in an F-100A. Not unless you wanted him to look considerably more green by the time his feet touched the ground. Since the story does make a point of telling us the cadets were flown to an air base, I found myself wondering, since they mentioned that there is a dry lake bed that they land on, if they were flown all the way out to Edwards Air Force Base in California, famous for its dry lake bed runways, which became the center of national attention in the early space shuttle landings. When I went looking for other facilities that might have dry lake bed runways or dry lake beds nearby, everything I could find was in proximity to the West Coast. You know, it was either Edwards, there's a place in Nevada, or Nevada, depending on your particulars there. So either way, no matter how you slice it, I don't think these boys are in New York anymore. Let's rev up our engines, Earl, and, well, I think they're already revved up. Let's just see if the oxygen holds out in terms of uh, a lot of the stuff that we need to get to in discussion. Uh, one of the things I wanted to talk about first, and because it actually was in order, like one of the first, I think, important themes that started the, the episode, it comes from Charles Thompson, you know, talking about fear and fear itself. But it also is bookended at the end of this episode where Captain Prickett says to Kostat, he says, there are two kinds of people, those who get scared and run and those who get scared and don't run. So from the get go, from the very first moments, the very few first minutes of this episode, Charles Thompson, he introduces us through the voiceover and through that voiceover, he says, Chuck, and that's Chuck Kostat, Chuck had the mistaken idea that a brave man is never frightened. And at least in my experience, and at least with the episodes that we've been covering for genealogy, it's been rare that we've seen Gene's idea manifest itself so immediately at the start of any of the episodes. And I'm wondering if he really needed to make this point so quickly to set the tone of the story so that the target audience of these young men that are watching would be so immediately put in the emotional mindset of Chuck Callstat's situation, and they would feel his fear and anxiety from the start, right? So it's like laying the groundwork for this kind of immediate emotional manipulation as writers do from time to time. Gene, for lack of a better term, kind of corners his audience into connecting with maybe their own anxiety and fear, and it makes that sympathetic connection you know, so much more quickly and immediately so that they can feel what Chuck is going through through the episode. So again, if we're going to assume that West Point is this series with the intent of inspiring its intended audience for whatever reason to be the next generation of future West Point men. I'm wondering if this is just another one of those facets for that character that Charles Thompson is talking to, you know, to be this radical thinker or to actually be romantically entangled or now to be emotionally challenged. So are we seeing this now in our sixth episode review as being a pattern of his writing as well? It could be with the intros with Cadet Lieutenant Thompson that it's sort of baked into the formula of the show. But, but, Gene is a staff writer on this show, so he has some agency in setting that tone, in setting that format. Now, I know that in the end credits every week we have... Uh, Jerome Lawrence and Robert Lee as the script consultants. And they're just credited as Lawrence and Lee because they had just written Inherit the Wind and everyone, everyone should know who Lawrence and Lee are. You know, you don't even have to put their full names in the credits for you to know who they are. It's sort of like, it reminds me of the old, the end credits of the old Wonder Woman series with Linda Carter. Costumes by Don Feld. The heck was that? Well, that was... That was the costume designer's first and last name glued together. But he was, at the time, so famous that when you saw that credit, you knew who it was. Either way, you know, we have some fine minds shaping this show. And I think there is a conscious effort to move this away from... There is a very stoic tone to Highway Patrol and Mr. District Attorney. Those guys show absolutely no emotion whatsoever. They just jump off of moving bulldozers. 
But here, we are trying to... Basically, we're trying to appeal to a new generation to join the army. And so I think it is prudent for them to say, okay, you know, let's acknowledge the human foibles. Let's acknowledge fear. Let's acknowledge that people like Hammeroff or our cadet and the man of action have failings that can be turned into strengths. Because, show or not, you have to figure that is part of the mission statement of what West Point does to its students. Now, since we're not following a specific show on genealogy, but rather tracing the evolution of Gene's writing across many shows, this show, unlike regular Mission Log, has no timeline to jump. So here's a little bit of a minor spoiler for something that we may catch up with again in about a year's time. There is an episode of Gene's later series, The Lieutenant. The episode is called To Take Up Serpents. That is almost exactly this same story, except it's stretched out to an hour. But here's the thing. That's not necessarily some kind of failing on Gene's part. This is something that happens all the time. Uh, you talk to almost any television writer... I'm sure they're going to tell you that they have tried to better an earlier version of a story that they already told in some other venue. Now, really, any writer, not just television writers. But I point up television writing because, especially in this era, when you are cranking out 39 episodes of something, one of those has to get done a week. You cannot grind to a halt because, oh, we just dried up on script ideas this week. That's a disaster if it happens. Now, if you remember the much-derided early next-gen episode, Code of Honor, Tasha Yar gets kidnapped by a primitive culture and has to fight her way out in ritual combat. Those exact same writers sold almost the exact same story as an early episode of Stargate SG-1, titled Emancipation, where Samantha Carter gets kidnapped by a primitive culture and has to fight her way out in ritual combat. Same writers, different show, basically the same story, give or take some minor details. It happens. It's kind of the script writing equivalent to the late lamented film composer James Horner, where you would swear he was writing nearly the same music from Battle Beyond the Stars, and then, you know, leveling up to The Wrath of Khan, a much more visible project, and then on to Crawl, and then on to Aliens you would think he was writing the same thing, except that if you actually go back and look at the body of his work in total, there's stuff in between there, like Batteries Not Included or Humanoids from the Deep, where it is obviously not cut from that same cloth. However, if you're a writer, or if you're a composer, if you are a creative with a proven track record, you're inevitably going to get hired by someone who says, could you just do the thing like you did on this other show? What are you going to do? So in many of these cases, if you detect repetition of material, there are any number of explanations. Maybe time is running short. You have to fall back on something you already did. Maybe it's the pressure of time combined with a lack of inspiration, which is a thing that happens to every creative in the world. Maybe it's the feeling that you didn't stick the landing and you could tell the story better in another setting with better resources. These are things that happen all the time, both then and now in television production. Now, one thing about the episode of The Lieutenant that I'm bringing up is that it is technically written by another writer, but Gene was the creator and executive producer of The Lieutenant, and he may have assigned the very skeletal outline of Jet Flight to one of his writers to flesh out in his own way, which... Hey, it's good to be king. You get to do things like that when you're running the show. The funny thing is, I like this half-hour version better. It's more compact and, yeah, I'm going to go there, a little bit more aerodynamic. I do have one major structural gripe, though. Now, we were talking about that message at the end, Norm. You get the impression that Captain Prickett and Chuck have had this heartfelt talk about courage off-screen. Mm -hmm. Really? They had this conversation 
off screen and we're just getting it summarized basically but you know lots of f100 footage in there so you know aerial stock footage basketball footage what are you going to do i guess it's cheaper than exposing new film you know, you brought up a really uh, a lot of really good points here from a production standpoint and also kind of like from the writers and artists standpoint. And I know that there's something that John and I talk about on Mission Log, and I'm going to paraphrase this, or I might get it right just because I'm just shooting from the hip, that there's this phrase out there that art is never completed or art is never finished. It's just abandoned. And then you kind of like pick up from where you left off because nine times out of 10, you're right about anyone in the creative business that actually has to create a product and artistic product, whether it's sculpture or painting or music, like you were talking about with James Horner or writing, you know, or even directing film or creating film projects. All of those are a snapshot of where you are in your creative process at the time. They have production beginnings and they have production deadlines and endings. And then you have to turn said project in regardless of whether or not you, the creator, are satisfied with it because as all creators are you Earl myself John anyone who actually created something we never really feel that we've settled on yes that is the best possible version of that created work that we have ever done or will do because that's just not the way we work creation is an organic process and it always continues so looking something like this it's probably the best script that he could turn in at the time him being Gene but it's probably not the the most complete version of the story that he wanted to tell. And maybe that's where the Lieutenant comes into play. Maybe that's where other of his future works come into play where he had, let's go all the way back to the transporter. Okay. The transporter was a synopsis. It was a pitch idea that never really developed. And maybe he never really had the chance to develop it because other things that he was able to actually concretely believe he can finish and produce and submit and get paid for, it just got in the way. But the thing is that it's an idea that still has the potential of being developed because it's just that part of the creative process he never was able to return to. Now, let's take a look at some of the things that you and I talked about offline. We talk about, say, a George Lucas. George Lucas can Star Wars in 1977 and has since, because of he himself saying that technology has been able to catch up with his vision, has been able to go in and refine for better or worse, refine the vision he believed that he wanted to achieve on film that he couldn't in 1977. Does that make it better? Does that make it worse? That's a very debatable point. But in this case, though... You always get to see the opportunity throughout time, especially if you delve into pop culture the way that you and I have, certain themes that get repeated over the course of other people's projects. And it's like, it's like that secret that's not a secret in Hollywood. If you pitch an idea and it's turned down, it may get picked up by somebody else who ends up developing that said idea. That's why in one summer you get Hunt for Red October and say Crimson Tide, right? Or you get like um, the disaster films that always echo each other because... Nine times out of ten, in my belief, Hollywood productions are like, we're not going to do that at this time. But we are in our own idea. And that's where you get something like, and I don't want to take this as a dig, but that's when you get Babylon 5 and Deep Space Nine existing in the same era. Right? Because the ideas were pitched, and I say this very loosely, simultaneously. And then you end up having two shows that are so very similar because the work can be extended from that particular germ of an idea. And I think that's where we are here. 1957, we don't see a lot, or we have not seen a lot of probably some of the biggest archetypal ideas developed for pop culture or for the, the audience or the industry. But now, 60 some odd years later, 70 years later, we've seen a lot of it in its own different interpretations. So I think that's, I think that's fair when we approach looking at something like this and in hindsight. Yeah, and I forget who it was who said, movies aren't released, they escape. Mm -hmm. You know, because that deadline is all... This is art as commerce mm -hmm. in Hollywood. Don't forget, commerce is always, always going to be part of the equation, especially if you're cranking out a weekly series. E you know, if you say something like, oh, we have to stop production because we're just out of ideas, you might as well pull the pin out of a grenade and drop it at your feet because you just set off an explosion underneath yourself. 
And there are so many other ideas that Earl and I haven't been able to get to in the length of this recording. So if you would like to hear more of our discussion, especially about the production aspect of this particular episode or what we believe could have been added to, please visit us at patreon.com slash mission log and sign up for the opportunity to see the uncut version of this recording as part of your Patreon membership. That's patreon.com slash mission log. And you're going to get what we affectionately call the VAM, the value added material of this recording. All right, Norm, we are finally taxiing down the runway, having landed And I think we have landed safely. But what have we learned from Jet Flight, this latest episode of West Point? I'd I'd like to say that, you know, it was a difficult thing to see. But again, as I said in discussion, I think Gene laid the groundwork for not only setting the message early, but not even really subverting our expectations with said message. Because, you know, as you said, as as much as we love this episode, you know, it it was very kind of um, telegraphed. It's just when you telegraph a story so early, you're hoping to see or at least, you know, sympathize with the plight of the character as he goes through, you know, the the rigors of said episode. The I guess the moral meaning or message that I found in this episode is what happens when you can actually respect fear and how does it actually become a positive in your life or how can you turn it into a positive for your life? Now, I want to set the stage of you know where we're at with uh, with Kostat in this So after unfreezing, because he froze uh, in the emergency landing sequence, um, Costet says to Captain Prickett, Sir, I'm sorry. I didn't know I scared so easy. And Prickett replied without missing a beat. It's all right. Some of your infantry exercises would have done the same thing to me, to each his own, huh? And you pointed that out, you know, brilliantly, you know, in our observations. And later, Costet confides in his friend Kenny, and he says... Something along the lines of, I don't really shy away from any of our infantry training. I love flying down zip lines, handling live grenades, experiencing live machine gun fire. None of that bothered him, but flying does. And it's such an interesting setup because it quickly and efficiently illustrates how intimidating training can be in the different branches and how we perceive them. Costat, as an army cadet, is being trained to engage the enemy on the ground. And in some cases, hand-to-hand, eyeball-to-eyeball. And he says to Kenny that the army requires courage and bravery and guts, right? And whatever it is, he believes that the fear that froze him stock still in the cockpit negates all of that bravery. And this is the most puzzling thing about men then and maybe perhaps men now. So the big question is, how does one setback force men to summarily discount, dismiss, or ignore the majority of the successes that they've achieved in their lives. How is it that men have been raised to believe that our personal and professional worth is a zero sum or all or nothing way of thinking? The most relevant points from the four part masculinity script where the author, Caitlin Barnes Langendorfer states that older men adhere to an idealized masculinity script that is incompatible with the realities of later life. And as men age, they continue to follow dominant ideas of masculinity learned as youth leaving them unequipped for the assaults of old age, according to a new study. Maybe, maybe not, West Point feeds into that. But here are those four points. And I think that all of them, in some way, shape, or form, are actually represented in this episode. Again, no sissy stuff. Don't show weakness. The big wheel. Seek success. The sturdy oak. Strong and silent. We don't talk about our feelings. And give them hell. And this is in this episode in particular. Men are to be tough, adventurous, never give up, and live life on the edge. Now, I'm not an expert in any of these points. I'm no psychologist. I'm no trained expert in any of this. But Kostat reminds me a lot of, say, Upham in Saving Private Ryan, right? Was he a coward? Or in his subconscious, does he just not come to terms with his own personal brutality that war would evoke in him? Let's look at Andrew Garfield's portrayal of the conscientious observer Desmond Doss, you know, in Hacksaw Ridge. Like, he doesn't want to kill. He wants to serve, but in his own way. So just because he chooses not to kill, does that make him a coward? Running into danger without a weapon? 
So I have just this question. I have more questions at the end of this episode than answers. And one of the big questions that I have is, is it more responsible to be yourself and to those around you to be honestly craven and know your limitations or a brave charlatan who people can believe and depend on you until they can't and it's too late? That's, that's what I come away with from this episode. So you're saying you can make the decision not to kill today. Thank you. You walked right into that. I'm so glad you picked that up. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And the thing is, I think you're absolutely right. Gene is telegraphing this stuff right up front. I've pointed out earlier in this show, Gene has more of a voice in shaping West Point, the show, than he had as just a freelance writer pitching into the earlier shows that he wrote for. So he's got some weight to swing around here and he has the ability to make the show his own here's the thing about gene roddenberry he was a pilot and quite a good one i will refer everyone to the august 19th 2021 episode of sci-fi 5 for an extremely simplified telling of just one of the stories from his legendary career in that regard i feel that that experience Gene's lived experience informs a lot of what we are seeing in this episode and is emboldening him to step around the masculinity script that we have covered so many times and say, maybe you should talk about things. Maybe you should talk some of this stuff out. Now, it's still the 1950s. It's not like he's telling anyone to hug it out. But I think it's very interesting that once you take this show from cadets and shenanigans and fried onions and make it about pilots and planes, Gene's on home turf. And he clearly feels like he has a bit more room to impart to the viewer some of the things that he learned in the pilot seat. Things such as, sure, fear can get you killed. Also, not acknowledging your limitations or Hell, not even acknowledging that you have limitations. That can also get you killed just as fast. Kolstad's fear is not painted as a bad thing. Prickett admitting that he'd be scared in a ground combat situation is pretty stunning for, you know, a big manly man fighter pilot character to admit in this era of television. How Gene slipped this past what I'm sure was some level of Department of Defense censorship or vetting of his scripts, I have no idea. But he is definitely tipping his hand and giving the very overused masculinity script, you know, not overused in our podcast, but given far too much societal stock in this era of American history, he's giving that masculinity script a much-needed poke in the eye and still bringing the story in for an entertaining and, I think, inspiring landing. You know, I think the reason, uh, and it's, it's possible that because we don't linger on the masculinity issue, say with Captain Prickett and saying that, you know, I'd be afraid or admitting that there are these flaws, you know, in these Air Force pilots or West Point cadets or even West Point officers, as long as it doesn't linger on it, you're right, it just kind of passes by, you know, in the course of the story. And again, the the possible discussion that Prickett and Kallstadt could have had about fear and overcoming it and making it a part of you that we didn't see on screen that was just kind of like very quickly referenced and, you know, I winked away, you know, on screen at the end. I think that that's where maybe the lieutenant's format of being twice as long allows us to marinate in that process and why in West Point, again, like those who are overlooking, you know, approval of the episode before it goes out are like, ah, you know, they don't really get it because it's not, it's not focused on as much. I wonder, and you, this is pure speculation because we don't have production paperwork on this episode. There's so much F-100 footage spliced in that takes up you know, again, it's kind of like the basketball game in a double reverse. It just takes up this awkwardly big space in the middle of the episode. Do you think maybe Gene wrote something that they asked him to cut? 
I mean, it's very well possible. Again, we don't have the script, so we don't know. And if there's anyone out there, we'll let you know how you can get in touch with us um, just in a brief moment. But yes, I do think that when you see things that are as obvious as filler material that may or may not have been produced or purchased as filler material, but, you know, again, B-roll, stock footage, things of that nature, it does leave a little bit of a fingerprint behind of there should have been something else here. It's literally just a sexier version of placeholder. That is obviously more interesting to watch than just the word placeholder versus, say, jets, right? So, yeah, I think that you and I and a lot of people in, in audiences that watch, you know, TV or pop culture projects know when things are wrong. It's like watching a bad special effect, right? You know it's not right. You just don't know how to describe what actually went wrong. And in some cases, like the basketball sequence in the previous episode and this, a lot of the plane sequences here, it does take up a lot of narrative time, writing time, for especially somebody who's getting paid kind of like by the word to put these scripts out for a lifestyle. So yeah, maybe there's something there that will like, you know, the DOD was like, nope, <laughs> we don't want that in there. Put a plane in there instead. Who cares about feelings? Boys like planes. With that in mind, it's still impressive how much of Gene's messaging is very clear in this episode, even if, you know, with sort of that wink and a nod conversation at the end, he literally was having to fly it under the radar. Mission Log Genealogy is produced by Roddenberry Entertainment. Special thanks to the Roddenberry Repertory Players. Our cast this week featured Steve Spindler as Chuck Kallstadt and Kanan Hess as Kenny. If you would like to support us directly, you can do so at patreon.com slash mission log for early access to shows and the mission log discord. If you have any material that might be of interest to us that isn't already in the Roddenberry archive, drop us a line at mission log at roddenberry.com. Our website is missionlogpodcast.com. On the next genealogy, the command. Special thanks to consulting producers Matt Esposito, Homer Frizzell, Tom Kozak, Julie Miller, Mike Richards, Mike Shavel, Paul Shadwell, and David Takachi. We'll be back next week with more of your favorite programs. This concludes our broadcast day. This is a Roddenberry podcast. For more great podcasts, visit podcast.roddenberry.com.